welcome to uh, techniques in creating great cross-platform apps. So I just want to set the scene to start with about kind of the, the context of this talk. And what we used to think about as applications kind of started out on just the iPhone, right? Just small mobile apps, probably just consuming an API and some content. But since then, apps have gotten wider and wider, right? We have devices like tablets, which are you know, a bit more attuned to like creating content. And since then, things like Windows, uh, as well as Mac OS now have an app store. You have more, more complex, larger applications. And now we're also seeing things on TVs, like Apple TV, uh, Xbox, and sometimes even more esoteric devices, such as HoloLens. So we've got this kind of wider range of apps we want to, or devices we want to target apps towards. Also, this ends up meaning we want to probably target multiple platforms. Uh, depending on if you're more mobile, you're probably looking at just Apple and Android. And if you're kind of heading to more wider range devices like desktops and TVs, you're probably also going to want to bring Windows into that. So Xamarin as a tool set is probably the, one of the best ways to do this in terms of hitting all of those sort of frameworks and devices. Uh, and we're going to go into a bit of what Xamarin is quickly just to get a bit of a recap. But also, we're going to look at something around MEVM. So this is a, a presentation model pattern. And what I've found is as applications get larger and larger, the view models tend to kind of aggregate, bring that code in. And we're going to look at some ways about how we can sort of reduce complexity within these apps. So that's kind of the, the basically the gist of this talk. We're going to look at a quick recap on Xamarin and MVVM. You know, just make sure we've all got a, a, a good baseline of what we want to talk about. We want to look at what's new in VS 2017 for sharing code, some of the new tools and techniques there. And then the real gist of this talk, which is around how we can reduce view model complexity as our apps get larger, as they move from just consuming an API into more of that sort of content creation. So who am I? Uh, my name is Nigel Sampson. I'm a tech lead at Pushpay, a uh, payments company in Auckland, New Zealand. I'm the project lead on Calibre Micro, which is a cro cross-platform MVM framework, funny enough. And I'm an MVP for Windows Platform Dev. There's my Twitter and GitHub handles if you want to catch up with me later on. So let's get into this. What is Xamarin? Xamarin's a, a tool set which lets you work on Android, iOS, and now Mac OS as well, using C Sharp with 100% API access and full native performance. So what does this actually mean? It means you're actually targeting the actual APIs, the underlying APIs, on those platforms using C Sharp. A good example of this is this. So here, we're using Objective-C to set the background image on a button. Top one's Objective-C, bottom one's C-sharp. They're roughly similar, different brackets. But they look pretty much the same. The really cool thing about this means is that if you're looking for a problem and you're working with Xamarin, you can just sort of look up the answer for normal iOS and then sort of mentally convert that Objective-C into C-sharp. It's not that particularly difficult. This does mean, though, that you end up writing for that app, uh, for that platform directly, but you can share code using your normal kind of patterns. So what does this lead us to in terms of architectures? If we want a tra sort of a tradition, we're going to write this three times. We end up with a sort of a siloed approach like this. We're going to write one app in Objective C, one app in Java, one app in C Sharp, and we're not going to share any code. We're going to write the same bug probably three times, have to test it three times, and chances are not fix all of it, maybe fix two, fix it two and a half times. Xamarin gives us something like this. We have, we can, we're still writing three separate user interfaces. We're writing them natively uh, and targeting the appropriate patterns and user interfaces for those platforms but we're now sharing our application and business services across all of them. We write it once, we can test it once, we can unit test it. And the beauty of it doing it this way is that this code is guaranteed to be platform agnostic, which means it's very easy to unit test. We don't have to worry about setting up GPS, dealing with file systems, because that's probably going to be dependency injected in. And it also means that we can easily move it across to even more platforms if needs be. But that's kind of half the battle. In my opinion, in this top layer, there's more code. There's stuff we can share there, or sort of extract and reuse. And this is what we call the view model in patterns like presentation model from Martin Fowler, which came out a while, uh, he talks about a while ago, but it's sort of been popularized more as MVVM. 
Now this is a pattern that extracts state and behavior from your user interface into classes we're going to call view models. This means that they're cross-platform, it means they're testable. And what do I mean by this? So if we all think of the sort of canonical login page, we have a username, we have a password, we have a button to log in. Right? We don't want the user to click the button until they log in, uh, so sorry, until they enter the username and password. But when they click that button, we want to check to see if those credentials are valid. If they aren't valid, we want to show them an error message. If not, take them on to the next page. That state and behavior is common across all your platforms. Why write that three times? Why not extract it from that user interface, write it once, test it once, and bind it to that user interface? This gives us a pattern that looks much like this. We now have our view models extracted from our user interface. We have a shim of what you'd call the uh, sort of the platform specific stuff, talking to the GPS, the file system, push notifications and the like. We also have uh, shared application services. So take a look and see what this looks like. So I have this uh, example view model here. Looks much like what I just talked about. We have a username and password, which the user is, which is being uh, into by the user. We have a computed property here called can login. It's only true when username and password are entered. We have a message we can set back to the user. And a simple login method basically checks are the credentials valid? If not, display a message, otherwise go on to the next page. Our interactions here around the, um, the navigation as well as the authentication are, depend are being injected by dependencies. Um, so this means we can easily test this. We can look at our unit tests. I can quickly and easily test, hey, given various combinations of user and password, can the user log in? And using mocks, if I say these credentials are valid and I log in on that uh, view model, verify we're on to the next page. So this means that I've extracted the state and behavior for this login page out into a separate class I can share across all my platforms and unit test it really simply. From the user interface side, uh, this is Xamarin Forms, which is essentially a UI abstraction la layer of across all the platforms. I'm binding my username and password on entry text boxes, so those properties, and I'm using the Calibre Micro feature here where I'm essentially attaching that login method to the button. One of the features of Caliburn is that once when I bind this login method to the button, it'll look for another property called can login and bind that to the, visit, uh, the enabled of the button. So that means as your chain, as, because this is a two-way binding, as I change username and password, can login changes, the button suddenly lights up and they can click login. And underneath that, an error message when something goes wrong. So this is a really simple sort of example about how we can write sort of state and behavior for classes that's cross-platform and easily shareable. So there's a lot of really good MVVM frameworks out there. Um, a few of them are sort of almost based here in Australia. Uh, Michael Ridland works on fresh MVVM. I think he's around this year. And Jeffrey Huntley works on Reactive UI, uh, and he'll be doing a talk later today. Of course, I wouldn't be remiss in mentioning Calibre Micro, which is the one I work on. So there are some new options in VS 2017. Uh, these are ones around how we can share code more, across more platforms. I just want to talk about them for a bit. The obvious example here is .NET Standard. Um, this is my kind of like my favorite ordering. Uh, this is my sort of general approach. I want to use .NET Standard if I can. It's sort of work my way down. Portable class libraries, they've been around for quite a while. Uh, and actually now with the release of .NET Standard 2, Microsoft are sort of officially deprecating portable class libraries as a sort of an approach towards sharing code. I'll go into a bit more about .NET Standard in a minute. Uh, Multi-targeting is the other one. It's a new, t new tool set that came out with VS 2017, and it lets you basically use, I've put it on the same line as shared projects because it works the same way in sort of your approach to writing code. And shared files, it's been around since Visual Studio has been around and uh, with its pros and cons. <coughs> so what is .NET Standard? Um, there are whole talks on this, so I'll only try and cut a little bit into it. But .NET Standard isn't a library. It's a standard in the same way that 802.11 is a standard for Wi-Fi. Microsoft published some standards. These are 
basically lists of APIs that a version of a runtime must implement to say it implements that standard. Now, what that means is you can now, when you create a new project, instead of using portable class libraries where you pick which frameworks you want, and when a new framework comes out, you have to wait for other authors to basically open up their projects, click a new checkbox, push to NuGet. Instead, you pick a .NET standard version. This means that your code, if it's written against that standard, will run against any version of any framework that implements that standard. Uh, these standards are always additive, they never are removed. So anything that implements 1.5 will also implement 1.4, 1.3, 1.2, etc., which is quite useful. <coughs> it also means that if you target 1.6, say straight away, or 2.0, when new versions of frameworks come out, that actually implement those standards, your code will all suddenly automatically work on there without you having to do any more work, which is quite cool. What you kind of end up having to do as authors is looking at a matrix like this, which looks particularly complicated, but we're just seeing the .NET standard versions across the top and the various flavors of framework down the bottom, and we can see where they get implemented. So we can see here that, you know, full, full framework 462 implements .NET standard 1.5. And what you can use basically do is work out what things you want to target and therefore what versions of the .NET standard you can use across all of these things. So multi-targeting. Uh, with the new SDK tools that came out uh, from Microsoft basically in the last sort of six months, we have some new project types. You know how the CS project is a lot smaller. One of the things it has is a target framework element which basically says this is the, the framework I want to target. You can manually edit that file to say target frameworks and put in a semicolon separated list of these frameworks. What this ends up with is essentially when I build this project, I don't get a single DLL output now. I get three folders in my bin debug, one for each of these frameworks and three separate DLLs. I get one, so one project is now out, doing multiple outputs targeting different frameworks. <coughs> so why is this useful? It means that rather than having to write potentially a .NET standard assembly and dependency inject code in, you can write one project that actually targets the actual frameworks themselves and uses things that are uh, appropriate just for that framework. If you do that, however, just write in some code that in this case, I'm targeting 1.4, .NET 4.5 and Windows 10. If I write some Windows 10 specific code in there and I hit build, two of those outputs are going to fail horribly. So I'd need to do things like build definitions um, and you know, if def around that bit of Windows 10 code. But for certain circumstances, it actually makes a lot more sense. We'll go into a couple of examples of that. Let's take a look. So I'm going to actually use the, um, the Calibre Micro code here as an example. So this first example, the top one, Calibre Micro Core, is a .NET standard assembly. So if I right click on that, and this is a really cool new feature in 2017. I can actually edit the project file without unloading it, which is really handy. So this is actually a bit more work. This is actually the entire project uh, for you know, all this code. The CS files are automatically included. You don't have to actually define them in your um, CS proj, which means that if you've got two devs working on the project, merge conflicts won't happen as much, which is really quite cool. Most of the stuff isn't actually needed. You can actually get rid of most of this, but the important part here is this target framework where I'm saying I'm targeting .NET Standard 1.0 because the core of Calibre Micro is actually quite simple. It means I can target 1.0 and basically run it almost anywhere, which is really quite useful. The next part here is this platform code. So this code runs and actually targets the XAML platforms across multiple frameworks, uh, Windows 10, Xamarin, uh, and so on, Xamarin Forms, and actually uh, WPF as well. So we have our sort of shared code, stuff that works everywhere. And then in here, I have some platform-specific code. So if I edit this project, You can see on the top line, I'm targeting lots of different frameworks. 
I'm saying when this builds, I want you to build something for .NET. It's not Xen 1.4, .NET 4.5, Windows 10, Mono Android, or Xamarin Android, and Xamarin iOS. I have some common properties defined for all of this, but then I can start to, to do some stuff that you'd kind of uh, define only for different frameworks. So in this case, I'm doing some defined constants, and so when the target framework is .NET 4.5, define a constant.NET, when it's Android, define Android. So let's, this lets me put if Android in my code and kind of conditionally compile around that. And then there's obviously some properties here that are just specific to those platforms. <coughs> Down here, what I do is I remove everything that's in the platform code. So basically everything by default, all those c -sharp files automatically get included into all target frameworks. That's not what I want. I don't want mono, the code that's in that mono Android folder being compiled into Windows 10. So I remove it. I remove everything in the platform's code, and then I do a, a none include. This is a bit of a hack, but it means that it always sh means that all the files always show up in my Solution Explorer, and they won't get built. I can then go down here and say, when compiling for 4.5, do the references I need to do into four, there, and then I include everything in the WPF folder back in. So essentially now, when I build for .NET 4.5, I'm building for everything in that main folder, plus everything in that platform folder, excluding all the other platforms. When I build this, I get four, five different assemblies, all targeting the appropriate frameworks, all able to use platform-specific code. So if I look in something like the Convention Manager, you know, I can have this conditional code in here doing different stuff on different platforms, but for the most part, the code is sort of 80, 90% shared, and it's not worth the effort to try and sort of dependency inject this stuff in. So this is a really good approach if you're doing a lot of work that's quite close to the middle in terms of user interface, um, but want to share a lot of that code between them. So let's get into the meat of this talk. So what I really wanted to uh, kind of talk about here was this idea that as we target larger platforms, we, you know, we're targeting things like desktops and TVs, we're building apps that aren't content consumption but content creation, our apps get more complicated. Now, when we write larger and larger code bases, there tends to be sort of cut points we find where code is the easiest to add and it kind of accumulates. <coughs> we see this in MVC. Uh, in the controller layer, right? The controllers tend to be the easiest place to add code. Those controllers get bigger and bigger and bigger. We call this anti-pattern fat controller. Uh, if you want to go read up on it, just have a quick search for it on Google and search through the Thomas the Tank Engine memes and you'll eventually find some stuff around sort of MVC fat controller. In MVVM, in an application layers, this tends to be the view model. Your view models tend to get bigger and bigger as you, it's kind of the easiest place to add code. And often I find I see people, if you're building applications where there's sort of shared user interface, you know, there's something up in the top left or top right of the screen, which is common across all screens, we find that people want to kind of sh stick that into base classes. You know, a base view model that all your classes inherit from, they can share that behavior and all as well. This just means that your code is harder to test. You've got more setup work to do, and it can be a bit more complicated. So let's sort of look at ways we can sort of tackle this. Cool. So one thing I want to do to start with is introduce a couple of concepts. And I think navigation is always sometimes the easiest way to talk about this. Um, in most platforms, we have a control that sort of deals with navigation. In iOS, it's the UI navigation controller. In Windows, something like a frame. Most MVVM frameworks wrap that control in a class navigation service and expose that as an interface out to your view models. Typically, what happens then is your view models can then tell that navigation service, go to this new view. And then the view can use something like a view model locator, find the appropriate view model for that view, instantiate it, activate it, and all as well. This leads us to a problem, though. Our view models, we don't want to talk about views. 
we want, we want our view models sort of abstract from the view itself. And also, we don't want to reference that view because typically we want that view model in a shared piece, uh, shared .NET standard assembly and actually can't talk to the view directly. <coughs> this leads us to kind of string-based navigation or URI-based navigation where we're referencing that view via a string. Often in some frameworks, we end up sort of registering different views with strings and then saying, hey, go to this view, which can make things a bit more um, refactor unfriendly. What I really want to do is target view models. I want to say, for this view model, I'm going to go to this other view model with some parameters. So this is kind of the main concept of here of view first versus view model first. So view first in the sense that we're telling the underlying control go to this view. As that view changes, we react to it, create a new view model, and carry on. With its view model first, well, we want to make changes to our view models and have the user interface update to reflect it. So this is the kind of core gist of what we want to do here. Make changes in our view models, update to reflect the views. So I talked initially about you know, pushing stuff into base classes and across shared behavior. We already don't do the, we, sorry, we already do this in our user interfaces, all right? If we've got something that's up in the top left, top right of our screens, we don't write, do that interface across all of our screens. We do it once in some sort of user control or a fragment and reuse it across all our screens. We should do this with our view models as well. We should favor composition of our view models rather than inheritance structures. No, don't have a hierarchy of view models that represent sort of flavors of your screens. Compose them together. And how does this work? So this is a demo we're going to look at later on, which is essentially just a GitHub browser. We have a shell view model that basically deals with creating the application and sort of structuring a few things. We have a menu view model on the right that's responsible for sort of basically looking at GitHub, building up a menu. And we have some repository details and issues list we can switch between. The shell view model shouldn't have any responsibility in terms of talking to GitHub itself. The repository details or issues list should. The shell should only be responsible for switching between these, user, these views. This means that you know, while we have four view models for this single screen, it means that we can break this up into sort of neatly testable parts. And we can do this because we have a view locator. Given a view model, by convention, we can find the view for it. Uh, most frameworks, as I said, have a view model locator. They go the other way. Given this menu view, we can find a menu, menu view model. What we want is the other way around. Given a menu view model, find the menu view. So how does this work in practice? Well, our shell view model is going to have a property of a type menu view model called menu. We're binding this to a content control. So this is a sort of Windows XAML. But this works in Xamarin Forms as well using a content view. We're going to bind to an attached property here. What this does is essentially tells the framework, hey, I've given you a menu view model. Go find the appropriate view for this view model, instantiate it, insert it into this content control. This means that our shell view model, all it has to do is expose the property. And our shell view only has to say, this is where it goes. It doesn't have to know at all how that menu actually looks or works. We can do this with multiple views for the same view model as well. And the patterns we see around this are things like master details, where we have a list on the left, which is a, a sort of a master view of that, uh, that page. And then we have the sort of one, once it's been selected, we have the view on the right, which is the details. So how can we do this? We can add some stuff around context. So we can add a context to our selection. Same sort of thing, which means we can go from order details view model to order details uh, with a master view. So let's take a look at some of these things. So we have a really quick demo here, which I'm just going to show the start of. We have essentially our shell here, which doesn't, doesn't do much at the moment. And we have our menu where I can select a repo and see its title and readme, etc.
If we look at our shell view model, it doesn't do much at the moment, right? All it has is a, a menu view model. It has a active screen. And that's it. Our shell view doesn't do much either. We have our split view control. So I'm doing all this in Windows 10, uh, just because it's easiest to demo. Uh, this all works cross-platform, Xamarin Forms, and the like. So this all works on Android and iOS as well. It's just that this is the easiest way to demo this code. So we have our content control here inside the pane of that split view, and I'm binding that to the menu. So the framework here is taking that menu view model, working out what's the appropriate menu view, and instantiating, pushing that into the, uh, the content control. <coughs> Further down here, I have another content control which is bound to the active screen in much the same way. And I have some buttons here to shift between the details and the issues list, which we can go ahead and implement right now. So I'm going to create my view details method. And all that needs to do is set the active screen to the details view model. Also for our issues, you can set it like so. So our issues and details were created up here in the constructor. So these are essentially those child view models we talked about. These are the things that have the, the functionality to go to uh, GitHub, look up the repo details, or look up the issues list. And all they're doing is changing the active screen which is this property here, which we know is bound to that main content control. So if I spin this up, click compile, what we get is again our shell view model, not really caring, this is taking a little longer, uh, about how those uh, user interfaces are displayed or even how they're actually working at all. We can test this, we can test this shell really quickly in the fact that we can call this hey view issues method and then assert that the current screen is that issues view model. And what's really important about this, so let's pick one here, I can now switch between issues and details just by clicking them. So that's really important, right, because in that first example, I talked about that menu being exposed as a menu view model, and then looking for that menu view. That was sort of singularly typed. We're only, we're only exposing a menu view model. In this shell example, you know, I'm exposing a net. My active screen is just of type screen, and I'm switching it between two types, between a repository details view model and an issues list view model. And the framework is working out what's the appropriate view for that view model at runtime. And we get this quick, nice and easy switch. In our issues list, we get much the same thing. We have a list view on the left. We're binding it to inserting the appropriate view for that thing on the view model list. And we're setting the context of master view. Again, in the main content of the screen, we're doing that again with the active item. So this is the thing that the user has selected. And we're sitting in the context with details view. And we're binding the active item to the selected item on that list box. What this thing gives us is as we select something here, that list box two-way binds to the active item in the view model. We then use it, basically insert that view for the view model into the other side of the user interface, but with a different context. This means that we can have two separate views. Over here, we have a details view and a master view uh, for that same view model and we can switch between them as we need to. So this is quite good, for, as I said, for master details, but there's a lot of other scenarios we can do this. We can take this even further 
in our issue list view. So at the bottom, I have a combo box here, which is essentially just a view selector. I want to go and in, into my list box, turn the take remove that context, and I can go set a binding on this to that view selector. And the path is the selected item dot context. So I'm just binding a list of views to that view selector. And now we have dynamic context selection for this. So an example you'd think about doing this is if you were in sort of Windows Explorer, right? You know, when you have a drop down where you want to pick between sort of details view versus uh, expanded view versus a grid, etc. So if I go in here, switch over to the list, and I have a combo box down here where I can switch between different views really easily, but just by dynamically binding that context, which up as that context changes, our view locator sw spins back into action, says, well, given this view model and given this new context, what's the user interface for it? Again, this means that we can do some really simple stuff in that a shell view model doesn't care about GitHub, doesn't even need to know about it. Our issues list, our issue view model, simply defines what's needed to show that issue list, uh, sorry, issue, and the issue list view model itself is the only thing that really cares about going to GitHub and getting those issues. We've broken down our code into about four separate view models. All are independently testable independently testable, sorry, uh, and all cross-platform. So, a lot of MVVM frameworks have this idea of being navigation aware, right? As you go to a view model, it says, hey, I've been navigated to or I've been navigated from. This works really well for this idea of single screen view models. You know, if you have a view model that encompasses your entire screen and you're just shifting from view model to view model, then this works really well. When you're composing your view models together, when you're building up larger trees of view models that are all managing each other, then simply being navigation aware isn't enough. These view models need to have life cycle. They need to know when they're being displayed on screen, when they're not being displayed on screen. This isn't just navigation aware because they can come, right, come back if needs be. A good example of that is the, uh, the master list we talked showed before. You know, as we select a, an item in that list, we need to better know, that, hey, I've been selected, I'm now being shown in this larger part on the right. Now, this life cycle needs to be managed by something. And typically in most frameworks like this, it's called a conductor. This conductor is conducting the, the sort of behavior in the life cycle of its child view models. And we can think about this like the navigation service itself is simply a conductor. It's essentially moving between view models, conducting that behavior, and it's saying, hey, I've been navigated from, you're being navigated to, and the like. And that's really important, and we'll show why in a couple of minutes. Once we've got this tree of view models, um, we want to keep them decoupled, right? We don't want uh, to basically have to pass references from like the menu you saw when I press, clicked on the menu item, the repository details updated. We don't want to have to have, have those tightly coupled together. And we can use patterns such as mediator, event aggregation, or messenger to do it. And almost all frameworks, sorry, like this, have some sort of um, built-in functionality, which we can take a look at. So we can see here, you know, this example here, we have our menu view model. It's pushing messages to our event aggregator. And the event aggregator is then pu pushing them onto the repository details and issues list. It means that our view models only need to depend on that event aggregator. They don't need to depend on each other. They're not tightly coupled. And it means that we can sort of make use of this by pushing messages in from other places that mimic the same thing as clicking something on the menu view. We don't need to care about that, which is quite good. So let's take a look at these in a bit of depth.
Okay, so we have our issues list view model. It doesn't do much, but it inherits from a thing called conductor collection one active. So this essentially means that it maintains a collection of child items, in this case issue view models, and only one of them is active at one time. Right, so you can think of this as being really analogous to master details. You know, we have a, we have a collection, one of them is active at one point. And really this just means that we have, in the base class, an items collection of type observable collection issue view model. And we have an active item of the same, same sort. Our issues view model inherits from screen. So it has a couple of uh, special interfaces. One is called iActivate, one is called iDeactivate. What this means is that we can then override and talk about code that happens when you're activated versus code that happens when you're deactivated. So we can now essentially write code that says when that issue view model is selected, run some stuff. When it's kind of something else is selected, deactivate the old view model and run some code there. What we want to do here now is load the issues for this, uh, sorry, load the uh, comments for this view model. So I'm going to inherit from something called on initialize. And what this essentially is, is first activation. So initialize happens on first activation only. The view model can be sort of subsequently deactivated and then reactivated. But for the most part, we only want to write, sort of get the comments once. And once, once we've loaded them into memory, stored them on the view model, if we then come back to this issue, we don't have to go back and get the comments again. So we can run kind of like first activation only. So we can get the comments. And then add them to the collection of comments we've already got here. Right, take the comments, and we want to select. Uh, whoops. We need to await this. Given a comment, build a new comment view model based off that comment. Let's spin this up. And what this means is when we select that issue in the view model, the conductor, that issue list view model, will tell that child issue list, issue item, sorry, that it's been activated. Because it's the first time activation, that on initialize will be called. We can get the comments. So go into We can see some comments loaded now at the bottom. And it means that when we click somewhere else, we go here and then come back to this one, those comments are already loaded. We don't have to worry about going back and getting them again. So this is, like, this, is this really sort of strong idea of about adding a life cycle to your view models, not just being navigation aware, not just saying, hey, you're now visible, but as they come sort of in and out, as these things get visible and not visible, then we can do a bit more with them. So let's look at this event aggregator. Our menu view model, the thing we're selecting from on the left, is depending on this event aggregator. And all it's doing is when we select a repository, we're constructing a new message. And this message is just really a simple DTO of actual re repo details, the owner and the name. And we are then publishing it on the current thread of the event aggregator. So that's all we're doing. All the message cares about is that, sorry, the menu cares about is when you select something, I publish. Which makes it really testable, right? You don't need to worry about if I'm wanting to unit test this menu view model, 
when I click the select repo, make sure the issue details show up. From the unit test point of view, it's just when you call select repo, verify a message is published on the event aggregator. You know, we, we can break these tests by sort of separating the view models in the user interface. We also make the tests easier as well. Our repo details view model, which cares about this, again depends on event aggregator, but also implements an interface called iHandle repo selected message. This means that you know, it's capable of handling these messages, and on construction it's calling subscribe this on the event aggregator, which basically says subscribe to messages on the event view model, and based on the in interfaces I implement, you, you can tell what messages I care about. And all that implement, all that interface does, sorry, is have an I handle, sorry, a handle method called repository taking that message in, and we can then respond to it, get the details, and populate them appropriately in the view model. So again, this makes it really easy to unit test in that now on the repo details view model, I can just call that handle method myself in the unit test, pass the message in, and verify that the, uh, the view model reacted appropriately to that message. So we've decoupled our menu view model from our repo details view model and made them a lot more testable and a lot more decoupled as well. What we can then do is take advantage of this by publishing messages from other places that essentially simulate the things of, as menu clicks. So what I've done is I've registered this app as a protocol handler. So click a URL, it opens up the app with some uh, URI. Got some code in here that's parsing this protocol, so it's just NDC owner name. So I can say, given a link NDC slash Nigel Sampson slash talks, open up that repository. And what I can do here, this is the code that's essentially parsing that protocol. When it comes in, it says, all right, here's the URI, parse it, get that stuff out and work out whether it's successful. I can then, in my application here, get a reference to the event aggregator via the container, because I'm in the main root. Get instance, event aggregator. I can then take a message, construct a new repository selected message based on the owner and the name that I've parsed of the URI. And then I can, again, we'll publish on the UI thread that message. Let's build this and deploy it. So now we're essentially, because we've decoupled that, uh, menu from the repository details, it means that anything can tell that details to switch repos, right? We can now have things like URI protocols, we can have other parts of our user interface that are completely and utterly far away from that details, say, hey, switch context, switch a different repo, which means you can have buttons buried down inside potentially issues. So if you imagine those issue comments had links towards other, other uh, repos, all that child view model, that issues view model right at the bottom can do to tell the whole application switch context is just publish that message. It doesn't need to know about that shell at all, it just needs to know about the event aggregator and that message type. So if we spin this up, as again, we're changing things, we're clicking things on the menu, uh, we're publishing that message, the uh, repeat repo details is listening to that message and all as well. And if I open a sample HTML file here, if we just quickly look at the source, we can see that it's linking to that protocol we talked about. If I click the button, we've switched over to that repo now. Right, we've got that activation from the URI, we're publishing on a message on the event aggregator, our repo details responds to it, and all is well, in the sense that we didn't need to kind of further uh, complicate our shell or our repo details. It just kind of works in the fact that we can sort of publish those me messages separately.
So what did we cover here? We talked about the fact that um, Xamarin and MVM is a great tool set for, for building cross-platform applications across multiple frameworks, across, sorry, across multiple sort of devices, right? We can target everything from phones like iOS all the way up to Xbox and more esoteric devices such as HoloLens. Uh, we can use something like MVVM to further extract state and behavior out of our user interface and share it using cross-platform techniques in a way that it's easily unit testable, more maintainable, and ultimately cross-platform. We've seen some new things in Visual Studio 2017 around techniques to share code across platforms using .NET standard as a way to now write coding standards rather than sort of ad hoc selecting platforms using uh, portable class libraries. And as that goes forward, it means that you're going to be able to write code to target new, that sort of automatically light up on new instances of frameworks like Tizen, um, or even as existing frameworks rev their versions, your code will suddenly work if they're targeting standards you're already using. <coughs> it also means that we as app uh, application authors, we don't have to wait for new and existing uh, framework developers to sort of spin their project up, tick a new box in portable class libraries, and publish to NuGet. That was one of the biggest problems I had uh, in a previous job. I was working on sort of early release Microsoft platform stuff, so we were getting weekly builds from, um, from Microsoft. And the trouble was that nothing worked. None of your, the normal open source libraries you kind of wanted to work with actually targeted that platform because it didn't exist yet. And literally all you had to do was open that project, tick the box in portable class library, rebuild and work. If it's targeting .NET standard, you won't have to do that. Essentially, all these frameworks, as long as that new, new version of that framework um, implements the standard, all that code is automatically there for you. You won't have to wait for things like JSON.NET now supports Windows 10 or anything like that. As long as, as, as JSON.NET targets that standard, anything that implements that standard will work. We saw stuff like multi-targeting. So this is a, um, essentially just a revision on shared files, right? It's before, if you pl sorry, played with shared projects, you know, we had one shared project which had all the code, and we had about three or four head projects which referenced the shared, and when you built each of those, sort of copied and pasted the code across and got the output. Now with multi-targeting, we have one project that can actually build multiple different outputs, which is really useful if you're kind of building that close to the middle code that really has to touch platform-specific things, but for the most part is reasonably shared. We looked at navigation and this idea of view first versus view model first. This idea that we want to use view model first instead. That we want changes in our view models, changes in the composition of our view models, to ultimately update the user interface rather than the other way around. This means that uh, we can better test the behavior of our view models better decouple the behavior of view models. And it means that, <coughs> sorry, that we can sort of better break down these view models and share them across teams in, in terms of being able to say, right, this dev, you work on menu, this work on repository details, and the contract between them is that message. We looked at conductors and life cycle, and this is this idea that view models shouldn't just have this idea of, hey, I've been navigated to, but more this concept of activation and deactivation, such that when you're composing an entire tree together, you can kind of better manage what's happening. All the code for this is up on um, GitHub, this URL. Um, some of it's spread across a few different projects, but it's all there. I encourage you to take a look at it. Get some photos there. Do we have any questions? Come back to that so you can take photos. Yes, oh. um, when you were doing the like composable uh, view models, yep. it looked like it was like very much like UWP centric. Do you have any like, guidance on how you might do that in like a cross platform Java forms? Yep. So the code I wrote for this is just UWP basically just for for demo purposes that it's really easy to demo on, on a Windows box. All the stuff I showed there, like that view.model where I'm binding and then doing view injection works in Xamarin Forms using Caliburn as well. All right, so we can, I've got a blog post up that shows doing that master details on Xamarin Forms, 
which means it works across Android, iOS, anywhere that Xamarin Forms runs. And to be honest, like the behavior here around sort of detect a, a view having a view model locator and injecting views while built into the box in Caliburn isn't particularly complicated to write and could be added to almost any, any framework you want and really isn't even like app specific, right? You can do this in JavaScript reasonably easily as well. I think a lot of frameworks already do. This idea of breaking down these big screens into components or view models based on whether you're in JavaScript or I think it's a pretty sort of known pattern these days. Does it make sense? I can uh, link, send you some links later on if you want about this on uh, Xamarin Forms. Anything else? So the advice was, sorry, the question was, uh, in this sort of framework, how would you handle different sort of device specifics, essentially, like uh, asking permissions for cameras and so on. So typically what happens is we jump back to an architecture diagram. So typically what we see is that code tends to live in this kind of layer here, right? So it's platform specific code. You have to write against those specific APIs. You then kind of wrap it up in an interface and then um, sort of expose it via the container to these appropriate applications, to your, to your view models and your other application services. Um, I think I've got an example of that somewhere. Yeah, so this is um, that first cross-platform MVVM example I talked about. So this is an, an example of like a, na a navigation service on Android, in the sense that it's working out what the current activity is, work, switching activities as it goes, and that's just exposing this application navigation service, and it's written in that's inside the sort of the Android project in this case, um, and then the application itself is registering that application service into the uh, navigation service into the container and therefore any view model can kind of use it and work with it directly and other projects come along and just implement that service so you are always going to have some code which is um, sort of platform specific you're always going to need that in terms of as I said working with the camera working with GPS and so on the, the idea is if you wrap it up in GP inside an interface it means that you can kind of test against it without having to put it on the on the uh, a simulator or actually on the device. Because <coughs> if you're using things like automated UI tests, those things tend to be a slower and more fragile. More code that you can kind of put in these gray boxes means that it, by nature, it's cross-platform, which means you can unit test it without the platform being there. And therefore. You know, you get that speed of sort of live unit testing if you want in VS 2017 or just standard unit testing without having to spin up simulators or actual devices. Anything else? Excellent, thank you. I'll be around uh, outside if you want to ask any other questions.